Hello and welcome to this evening's event, um, Celebrating Black Fashion. My name is Mal Birkinshaw, I'm the Head of Design at Edinburgh College of Art, and I was also the Programme Director of Fashion until 2020. Um, the Fashion Programme has collaborated with the National Museums of Scotland for a number of years, and especially on activities relating to the Diversity Network, an initiative created in 2011, which sought to unite academics, fashion industries, charity sectors and the public to address key issues and solutions relating to the lack of diversity in the fashion industry. As such, it's really a great pri privilege tonight to be invited to host this rescheduled event, which was originally part of Black History Month, where throughout October, events across Scotland were held to recognise Black history in our history and heritage spaces, and most crucially in our education system. I'm delighted to welcome you to, to tonight, really. So while we wish you could come in person, we wish you could be here with us. We wish we could hold something like this together. It's great to be able to share this experience with viewers from across the country and the globe uh, more widely. Um, but before we start, I just need to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, if you have any technical issues, please let us know by using the Q&A function and we'll do our best to assist you. This event is being recorded, but rest assured, your cameras and microphones are all switched off. This event includes live captioning. So if you do want to switch this on, please click on the CC button in the menu below. There will be the opportunity to ask questions after the event. So please do type your questions into the Q&A bar as the event progresses. But without further ado, I'm just delighted to be joined by this evening's very special guests. And I'm really interested to see what kind of enriching discussions we, we will have. Um, and firstly, we're joined by the very wonderful and the very talented Eunice Olamidi. Eunice is a leading international Scottish supermodel, broadcaster, fashion commentator, and curator who has worked for top designers and has appeared in several exciting films of which you will shortly see a little more about in a film we'll share soon. Eunice also runs her own fashion label, and she's also established the Eunice, the Olamide Gallery in London. Um, Eunice, welcome. It's great to have you with us this evening. Hello. Hi, thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. Thank you. And uh, next, I'd also like to introduce you to Georgina Ripley. Georgina is the principal curator of modern and contemporary design at the National Museums of Scotland and responsible for fashion and textiles collections from 1850 to the present day. Georgina was the lead curator for the Permanent Fashion and Style Gallery, which opened at the museum in 2016. In 2019, Georgina curated the incredible and extremely groundbreaking exhibition Body Beautiful, Diversity on the Catwalk. And hopefully some of our audience here have, have been able to see that exhibition um, in person to appreciate how wonderful it, it, really, it really is. And it's also touring and continues to tour. Um, the exhibition is the first of its kind and celebrates how designers, photographers, and creatives within the fashion industry embrace inclusivity and body positivity through the key themes of age, disability, gender, race, and size. In creating this exhibition, the museum consulted industry professionals and diverse voices whose experiences reflected these key themes. And it's here that Eunice was instrumental to that process as a member of the advisory panel. And this esteemed role reflected Eunice's renowned standing and experience now within the fashion industry. As both a model and an advocate for positive change, her journey has certainly been a remarkable one. In fact, in 2017, she was appointed member of the Order of the British Empire, an MBE for services to broadcasting the arts and charities. So you need to be kind of bowed out to you this evening because that, that's incredible. Um, I just want to move on a little bit with that, with that discussion around the MBE and to say that in 2018, the National Museum of Scotland acquired that MBE. So they hold that, that beautiful medal as part of a project called Collecting the Present, which is a collection of present day objects that document changes in our culture, politics and society. And we have a short film now that will tell the story of that process from Eunice's perspective. And now we'll go over to the film. I'm such a sort of tomboy, I'm really into sport, never wore makeup, nothing like that at all, not a girly girl. The first two, three, four times I was scouted, I didn't take it seriously at all. There was a possibility that I wasn't going to become a model. Going up in Edinburgh, 
It was a really interesting experience. Um, almost quite unique, I suppose, because my parents coming from Africa and being born in Scotland. The first two, three, four times I was scouted, I didn't take it seriously at all. I didn't look into it, I didn't contact the scouts. And then it was literally the last time that I was scouted that I thought, well, I'm gonna go in and see the agent and see what this is about. Actually, for me, it was the first opportunity in my life that I had um, been seen as kind of like everyone else. And I was being given a job from my parents, which was something that I didn't think was possible. I had quite low self-esteem, so actually it helped build that for me. From about 19, I decided that I wanted to definitely go into film and TV. I was lucky enough to have uh, some small features in Ab Fab the movie, which was a lot of fun. Star Wars was absolutely incredible. I, I had a, a small role on Rogue One. I was an insurgent, so it was kind of like an army uniform. It was freezing cold, there was lots of running, jumping, um, escaping from stormtroopers. The Last Jedi, totally different scene. I was in the casino scene and I was a, a casino princess. I was quite shocked when I got the MBE. I had to think about it quite a lot to decide if I wanted to accept it. When I think of MBE, I think of monarchy and I think of the empire. And obviously that's not something that I particularly at all agree with. So I spoke to my family, my mom, and she kind of explained to me about her journey and what it was like uh, coming to the UK then and working here and all the other families that had come. So I wanted to accept the award uh, more to inspire the people that I work with um, and just to show that it is possible to, to really be seen and be heard and be respected for your work regardless of where you come from. And so what does it mean to you to have the MBE here at the National Museum of Scotland? It's really important for me not to kind of hold on to something, I'd rather share it and it's available for everybody to see. The objects that go on display include the MBE itself and then there are objects that tell us about Eunice's story. There are her school ties from her younger years growing up in Wester Hills and a recording of her music with lyrics inspired by the people in that community. Then there are more recent objects, a pair of sunglasses from Eunice's fashion label and a book, How to Get Into Fashion, that she wrote to help other people get into the industry. The group as a whole tell us about Eunice's varied career, her interest in story and her personal achievements. Fantastic. Um, Eunice, I, I loved watching that. I felt really sort of inspired and, and, and sort of empowered. And, and I loved the part about the school ties, which just took me back to being sort of 16 myself with all that ambition that you have at that age and you don't know where it's going to go or how to make it sort of happen. And so uh, I, it, it took me to sort of, you know, wonder how that felt for you or feels for you. Um, is there a sense of pride in seeing your achievements depicted like this, you know, through through this sort of film? And and, and, and what do you feel at the moment about, about the sort of MBE? Is that a real sense of achievement now? I think that for me, <clears throat> generally speaking, just because of my character and personality, I still do find it a bit overwhelming. And I tend to be quite, not dislocated from it, but I like to just share and look at it as if I was, you know, one of my friends or just somebody who was interested in that type of work but at the same time I obviously recognize that you know these are really significant things so for me it's just about really sharing that journey because I think that's 
the way to sort of empower and support other people on their own journeys too. And so, I mean, it, it seems to me, um, thank you for that, but it also seems to me that I think your, your main drive to want to inspire people is to inspire young, young people as well, to sort of realize their potential and realize their dreams. And we'll get onto that later, I think, when we discuss a little bit more about, about your book. But um, I, I just wondered if you could describe, I, I, I still, I'm still struck by the idea of the, I'm struck by the school ties to the MBE and the sort of gap in between it. I wondered if you could describe that kind of, I'll only call it a trajectory because it seems like an ascent that is a, that is a really fast uh, pro propulsion really of success. And, and, um, and within the context of being, a, a, you know, starting off out as a Scottish model um, with huge international impact and, out, and, and outreach now, do you feel really confident now because you were not confident before and has that process made you feel confident and how do you inspire that confidence to to, to young people and to, and, and to others what's your key message there? I definitely 150% agree that it's made me more confident more so in the sense of I suppose everybody has insecurities and everyone often feels like they can't achieve things and sometimes actually for very genuine reasons um, but I think that one of the best things about education and learning particularly travel is that it encourages you to step outside of your comfort zone and therefore automatically have to negotiate many of the things that we often shy away from and I think that working in fashion for me it was a complete revelation, actually. I didn't even know that such an industry existed and it wasn't actually what I wanted to do at the time. I was very kind of geeky and academic and I really just wanted to study. So I think that, you know, one of the most inspiring periods for me, I think in sort of recent history, even though it's quite a long time ago, um, and obviously for the young people, you need to hit this up on Google, but I really love the Renaissance period in, in, in our history because this was a time whereby, you know, the word university is actually a derivative of the word universal. And at this time, one would or person would go to university and they would study a variety of topics. And then after that, they would choose to major in a specific field. And what tended to happen was people were very multifaceted in their understandings of life and they just had more of a 360 understanding. And I think that possibly through the wave of the Industrial Revolution and just the way that I suppose the world has developed we moved into more of this kind of singular approach whereby we tended to specialize in, in particular areas. And I think for me, when I listen to and I look at the way that people perceive, I suppose, my life, I find it really interesting because for me, I'm basically just doing and creating. Um, actually, out of necessity, I, I really feel sometimes we can overcreate and that's usually from necessity. Um, I feel like everything that I do is just on one continuum and as part of one flow. Um, and I don't feel that anything that I do is separate in any way. Although that's not to say that, you know, it's not important to become professional in a specific field to the point whereby you are, um, I suppose, able to perform that work to a specific standard the same as your peers within that relative industry that's really important and I always encourage young people to focus on what you're really passionate about what you really care about what you're really good at so and if you can do that then there's no need for you to do anything else but at the same time if you find yourself inspired by more than one thing there's also nothing wrong with that as well and I think even though I'm slightly moving away from fashion I do think that's important just because particularly for young people we're moving into this you know unique and miraculous um, point in time in human history 
whereby, you know, with technology and so on, there's going to be far more automation. And that does mean that machines are going to be doing more things. But what's, I suppose, most unique coming back to fashion about this new era that we're moving into is that particularly creative people and people who work in the arts, these are skills that actually can't necessarily be imitated or done um, through automization and through machinery. So it's going to be even more important for us to be able to contribute to society and to be able to solve problems um, and to actually unite with other industries in order to create a more sustainable and diverse environment. Yeah, thank you for that. And I, I loved how you started that with the, the comment on the Renaissance um, period, which is sort of close to my heart as well. But uh, and, and also you talked about, you know, uni university and then universal and then and then something about being multifaceted. And I was struck by, you know, when I was really sort of looking at doing this talk today, I thought that Eunice is multifaceted now. <laughs> There's so many you've got so many fingers and so many pies and you're involved in so many different and contrasting um, areas. And I can really sense that that's come out of a journey um, and an exciting journey as well, where you've been quite open to new experiences and to different people. And um, that seems to be, you know, one of the most inspiring things that, you know, in, in, in talking to you today and will be inspiring to so many young, I say young creatives or young ambitious people um, in the world. So um, thank you for that. I, I could really relate to that. And, 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 and it's refreshing to hear the a sort of narrative of a journey um, that you're still on is just growing and, and growing. Um, I mean, really your perspectives around education sort of take me a, a bit further on to the Body Beautiful um, exhibition itself and your, your involvement there. Um, and you've clearly been a catalyst for a range of improved practices in the industry. Um, I'd like to sort of move on to kind of better understand how yourself and Georgina both worked together um, to create the Body Beautiful um, exhibition or, or, or your, your impact there, which is undoubtable, and your influence. And I think we should start off by um, showing everybody a short film that will briefly introduce the sort of flavour of the exhibition um, uh, really distinctly. So um, we'll have a look, have a quick look at that film and then move on to more questions between uh, you and Georgina as well. So thank you. Everybody wears clothing to feel better about themselves. It's a suit of armour for me. I definitely wanted to challenge the norm. Celebrating difference. Now we have a voice on social media. My one fear is that diversity has become prescriptive. The question I constantly ask is, who's not in the room? The industry has a lot to do. I hate fashion. <laughs> If collaboration is not at the core of creation or design, the solution is going to be sympathetic rather than empathetic. So by not bringing in the people who have a lived experience and listening to them and taking action, it really begs the question, why even bother? When I started laundry service initially, I was kind of thinking, are there any black women at the heads of brands or at the heads of prominent brands that I can like look up to? and I couldn't really think of any. It's a shame to pigeonhole people and to pigeonhole yourself into thinking people only look a certain way or do a certain thing or a certain thing is only beautiful. I think students and designers need to make that connection um, much, much further and really realise that they take a responsibility in improving somebody's mental health and self-esteem through their clothing. Early on at the beginning, there were many, many more black models uh, and Indian models, uh, then suddenly, it, they seem to disappear and, we, you know, one said, well, what's happened here? In 1980, three magazines emerged, um, Blitz, The Face and ID, and it was very much about celebrating um, difference and, and redefining beauty. You had people like Jean-Paul Gaultier, you had people like Body Matt, who were, you know, their catwalks were filled with a diverse casting. I think inclusivity in fashion needs to evolve from just being a moment to being a movement. Because representation isn't just a model on the front of a magazine, it's people behind the scenes, it's people calling the shots, it's people actually making things happen. Who's the CEO, who's the director, who's the producer, all these things, when they're truly diverse, it's not just race, it's also sexuality, it's also age. Once the pure definition of diversity happens, 
it'll really be solidified in our DNA within the creative scene. I think it's really hopeful now that you have a new generation of young people who are embracing the same things. Yeah, I get impatient with these organisations and institutions because it's so slow when I feel like things can happen now. Well, that was just great to see. And I found myself smiling and grinning all the way through it and experiencing it like I experienced the exhibition on the, on the first visit, which was really about sort of empowerment and positivity and something that's very dynamic and, and, and game changing. And, you know, that, the Body Beautiful exhibition was really the first of its, it, of its type and really sets a precedence for how uh, museums and curation can improve um, you know, for their audiences and, and really address much more diverse audiences um, through some of their subjects and collections. And um, Georgina, I was, I, was, I was wanting to ask you, you know, having uh, valuable and insightful voices like Eunice's um, clearly impact the development and success of such an exhibition. So um, what, how did you work with Eunice on the early stages of the exhibition and why was it so important to engage with real experiences and real experiences and, um, yeah, clear, clear voices in the industry and meaningful voices in the industry too. I think it was very clear from the start that in order to do this exhibition and to be able to do it well, we were going to have to do it collaboratively. And I think it really did come about because I was struck by seeing all these headlines asking, is diversity a trend? And then speaking to people like Eunice, like um, Kelly Knox, who worked with us um, on the panel as well. And both working within the industry and sort of saying, how can diversity be a trend when this is actually my life that you're talking about? And so wanting to situate that within an exhibition where we could look at what had actually come before, you know, diversity had become a bit of a buzzword at the time, but it wasn't something that actually was new as something that the industry should be addressing. It was certainly not a new conversation, but it was wanting to really establish why this moment might be different. Um, and in order to do that, it was very much about being able to give control of that narrative to the people who it involves and, and who it affects. Um, and Eunice was one of those who very kindly agreed to join us, as did you yourself, Mal, on the advisory panel. So wanting to work with people, so Mal from the Diversity Network and Deborah Bourne and Karen Franklin, who'd established All Walks Beyond the Catwalk, um, to start asking the industry to address diversity as early as 2009, I believe it was. And then going to people like Eunice and Kelly, Sinead Burke, Jamie Windust, and the photographer Amos Mack. Um, and it was people like Eunice who were very generous in just sharing experiences, allowing me to send quite a lot of emails, asking a lot of questions, asking for help with terminology, um, asking for insights, uh, being very patient with me probably as well, I think, um, and being just giving me a space where I could ask questions that at the time I kind of had to really humble myself to ask and felt at times almost uncomfortable asking but they were very generous to um to allow me to do so and in order for us to be able to to put on this exhibition I think with integrity and to be able to give this platform to to other voices it was about removing that museum voice as this authoritative voice and it being a dialogue between people within the industry Thanks, Georgina. And I think I can attest to anybody being involved in that early stage with you, I think was just so excited that this was going to happen and it was going to happen also in Scotland and it wasn't going to be a sort of London centric um, uh, propulsion of, 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 a, of a new format for exhibition. I think it was it was just a really exciting time a, a few years ago and really felt, I think from the museum perspective really felt like it could be long lasting and meaningful and not just a sort of catwalk show. I think that's the power of the, the, the museum sectors and exhibition and curation um, to creating a really, really clear public uh, message and long lasting. And um, Eunice, I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about your perspective from the other side uh, and your role in the exhibition and what it meant to you to be sort of asked to be involved and then to be able to input into something so um, pivotal and game changing and important. In, in, in the sector? Well, I think for me, um, the first thing I've got to say is that these types of exhibitions really cannot happen without incredible institutions such as the National Museum of Scotland. And not only them, but 
you know, universities and other institutions such as the Edinburgh College of Art. But again, more specifically, it has to be negotiated and created and supported and wanted by the curators themselves. And I think for me, working with Georgina was something that was unique to a certain extent because a lot of the time, and it's not intentional necessarily, there isn't enough of that real grassroots searching for answers to ensure that what we communicate, what we give to the audience is as much as possible and as diverse as possible. And, you know, we're never gonna get that 100% right, but, you know, this is what it takes and this is what is at the heart of an exhibition such as Body Beautiful. And I think, you know, I was truly honored to contribute as well as work with so many other brilliant innovators and minds in order to create something that we hope the world would really be able to enjoy. So I, I couldn't have asked to work with a better team of people. And I really feel that that was also reflected by the audience. Thank you. And, and Eunice, why, why do you think it took so long for museum and industry sectors to really start to, to, to address these important issues and really embed them? I think, you know, there's a, there's a great perception that, you know, I mean, we started the diversity network back with Karen Franklin and Deborah Vaughan back in 2010. And so we're now, what, 11 years later, you know, it's taken an awfully long time for for a lot of this to happen and uh, you know why do you think that might be and uh, that's sort of a big question to you and I do apologize because it's it's okay if you don't directly have the answer but I thought it was interesting as a sort of discussion and maybe maybe for Georgina as well to to to, to maybe chip in there but it's it, it, it sort of astounds me that it's taken so long to for the first exhibition of this type to, to take place really. Well, I think that, you know, institutions, organisations and particular industries are all really a microcosm of the wider social, economic and political environment that we live in. That is the reality. And I think that one of the things which is really interesting about right now and what's going on right now in the world, which is, you know, obviously trailblazed by our um, and our ancestors and our predecessors and our parents and those who came before us, but then met in the middle by, you know, our generation and the new generations, the next gens, the millennials. And I think it's this culmination of so many people's efforts that's led us to this moment whereby this is something that is part of our consciousness and we genuinely have a true need to share it in society. I do think it's taken a long time. And I really think that part of that has got to be due to, I suppose, the very undiverse um, um, education of particularly, not just Afro-Caribbeans, but particularly, you know, people of colors, uh, history, as well as contribution to the United Kingdom. If that's not part of the, you know, the um, national curriculum in the right way, if that's not part of our, our excellence curriculum, then, you know, people, young people, all people are growing up without that kind of greater knowledge of what has gone before. So I don't think that I would necessarily look at museums and institutions and think, well, why haven't they done that? Because essentially that desire might not have been there you know universally in this part of the world however because of various significant events you know many new there's been so many new curators and contributors and I think that that's why it's so important to have curators and institutions such as Georgina who really really want to get to the truth and to create new diverse work. 
Thank you. And Georgina, did you, did you have a sort of comment on that as well? Or, uh, you know, how did it must have felt quite sort of, um, you know, you were trailblazing as well. And that must have felt quite, quite challenging to go into sort of seemingly uncharted territory, which sounds bonkers, given that we should be reflecting back to the world who we are and that should be through exhibition and display but it but it must have been fairly daunting for you um and and, and I wondered if you had any sort of comments about that process I think there was just a sense at the start that I wasn't sure how it would play out um we knew we had the support from Edinburgh College of Art and the diversity network and you'd been so um inspirational at the beginning in terms of sort of sowing the seed of the idea for the exhibition um and we, we worked closely with the students. So all these pieces started falling into place, but we weren't sure we, when we went out to industry, how it would be received. And it was from that point that we just realized, you know, people really were so enthusiastic about joining us. We, you know, the people that we, that you saw there in that film, it was incredible to work with all of them. It was incredible when we got the advisory board together. Um, it was actually probably my favorite project I've ever worked on just because of how many people it involved and how wonderful they all were to work with. Um, and it really did evolve as it grew. It just took on its own shape. And I couldn't have predicted where it was going to end up, really, if you like. You try to sort of, you know, as the curator, you have this idea of a narrative that you want, this kind of overarching direction, as it were. But ultimately, we were really just kind of willing to go with the flow on this one. Um, and it really was, it really was a huge, huge team effort. Thank you. And uh, I, I Thanks for that. Um, just before we go on to the next question, I think that's that's back to Georgina. I'm just going to make a little reminder to ask um, people in the audience to drop their questions, drop drop your questions into the into the chat box um, because we'll have a Q and A um, later, and it'd be great if we've got a sort of rich selection of questions to ask our our, our, our panel members today. Um, moving on to the next um, question is really around you know obviously you know the way that you had to approach many areas in the exhibition. Um, relating to diversity and equalities is, you know, can be very sensitive and, and, and again, some unknown or uncharted sort of territory. And the subject of race is an area that has been in constant flux, really. Um, and also during the exhibition um, run and opening, we saw the, the sort of uprising, really, of, of Black Lives Matters. And I wondered how that affected um, or has affected the sort of um, ongoing development of the exhibition and whether you've had to sort of adapt or change um, exhibition content or or update because I think so much of my understanding of you the curation of the exhibition was about learning how to do things in the right way how to talk how to speak how to how to convey important messages yeah I mean it was a difficult exhibition to do in the first place because it is a continually evolving topic and the language around it is continually evolving um, I had to rewrite all the text the first time around three days before I handed it in because we had a new round of fashion shows and all the statistics had changed and things that had been seeming really positive had gone the opposite way and then of course when the exhibition had just been in Sweden it went into storage during the pandemic and um, as we all know a lot's happened over the last 18 months but particularly with the um, international protests last summer the Black Lives Matter protests we really felt that there needed to be a change to the text within the exhibition. I mean, there are many changes that happened across all of the themes, but particularly with regard to the race section, because one thing that we're trying to do within this exhibition is to, to show the change that is happening outwardly and this outward commitment to diversity that we see, but also this notion of inclusivity being about this more meaningful interior change and that the two aren't necessarily happening in tandem. Um, and one thing that we really wanted to bring out in the text is the fact that last year you saw these brands seeking to align themselves, not just fashion brands, I should say, a lot of corporations, but seeking to align themselves with anti-racism protesters on social media. And it just so happens within the realm of fashion, they were also attracting criticism simultaneously for not having or having had this historic reluctance to address systemic racism within the industry. Um, and just wanting to kind of draw attention to that within this exhibition mm -hmm. as well because I think it's not an exhibition about saying oh look great people are starting to to make changes and you know our work here is done it's about showing the relative progress um 
And also, I think it's important to give space to to the kind of initiatives that have sprung up over the last um, couple of years. So the 15% pledge established by Aurora James, the Black and Fashion Council, the Fashion Minority Alliance, all these initiatives that are going to be holding brands accountable and who are really challenging these corporations to elevate and give space to black creatives within the fashion and beauty industries. That's great, thank you. And 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 how how are approaches to sort of future exhibition, your future exhibition and curating being embedded into future collecting practices um, in, in terms of sort of what you're acquiring and displaying as well. So it's not just in the in the aesthetics of how you display or, or the narrative there. It's actually in the in the pieces that you acquire from 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 designers across the across the world. Yeah, we, we learned a lot doing this exhibition from the people that we were working with, but we also learned a lot in terms of when you're trying to put together an object list. And obviously it is very contemporary, but a lot of the pieces alone. So we wanted to think how, you know, how do we evaluate this process moving forward and what does it mean for us? And it means thinking about our displays in a different way, and it means thinking about what we collect in a different way. Um, so we recently, as an example, um, collected a piece by the brand Maximilian, designed by Maximilian Davis. It's actually collected for our forthcoming exhibition, on, which will be on the little black dress, but we have put it out in the Body Beautiful tour, um, just because this is a, there's a really lovely story to this collection. So it's the debut for Maximilian, and it's uplifting the history of the Trinidadian carnival, which is intrinsic to his roots. Um, and it's drawing on this event, which uh, once upon a time was about enslaved people performing for their enslavers. But after emancipation, it was reclaimed as a space for um, black history and identity to be expressed. And what Maximilian's tried to do is to create these pieces which are elegant tailoring that draws on this 19th century inspiration, but also you'll have seen in that picture incorporates the, the cutouts that are worn in carnival dress today. And um, so it had this lovely story to it. Um, we purchased it and then Michaela Cole happened to wear it to the BAFTAs, um, which was very kind of her. <laughs> um, she's modelling it beautifully in that image. Um, so that's just an example of what we want to be doing moving forward. It's been a good chance to take stock of, of our collection and to think about representation happening, not only in terms of display and interpretation, but in terms of the actual objects that we acquire as well. Thank you. That's great. And, and that was good timing for you as well. I think that was a fortuitous, um, yeah. Um, Eunice, what would you say to exhibition curators and museum sectors about sort of addressing equalities and positivity and, and sort of change? Because I, I, I was really struck by the film where you talked about yourself as a, as a young girl and not having, having confidence and not realising there was a sort of fashion industry or, or really even realising that was sort of out there. And, I sort of wondered had had you seen a had you been party to an exhibition or seen an exhibition like this as a a young person as I would have done and needed to do uh, when I was a, a much younger um, what would that have meant to you and and what would you say to to the future future global museum sectors in terms of this subject? Um, so I think that for me personally, it all starts from the foundations and. I think that one of the most difficult challenges of creating diversity is ensuring that um, the role is carried out with the right le level of qualification and integrity that is necessary for that. And I think that therefore that means it must start at a very rudimental, fundamental level. So therefore I would encourage institutions and museums and galleries to start with, I suppose, their hiring pools, start with ensuring that there's adequate DNI and policy implementation in terms of strategy and how those organizations can make sure that they're connecting with the right audience that will strengthen their hiring pools, as well as look at the existing roles within their organization and ensure that those are as diverse as possible. And that goes right down to, you know, contributing departments. So that could be your marketing department. So if that's public relations, you know, make sure that the PR department has a quota, um, you know, if they are, you know, having events or if they're inviting people or if they are 
opening up opportunities for employment to make sure that you know there's a real push to look for diversity um, and the more people that obviously you're working with you know evidence suggests and proves in fact that a diverse working atmosphere really does produce the best results and a much more rounded view of the world and reality you know so I think that is a really good place to start and it's a really I hope practical way that they can start to do that um, and I think that everything goes from there because if you have a robust uh, workforce and team they're going to naturally bring their experiences their background their culture their understanding of life into the workplace whether consciously or subconsciously and therefore that's going to automatically in many ways influence and impact the way that they perform their role. Thank you. I, I couldn't agree more. And I think it, it struck a chord with me about a discussion that I had with a, a colleague last week or where, where somebody had at one point called, called me an expert on diversity and I really rejected that and said I couldn't possibly be an expert in diversity. And, you know, and then it made me sort of think about lived experience and how, you know, diversity or equalities really means people coming together and sharing lived experiences and listening and using that for as, as a sort of power or, or a positive force. So, you know, I, I, th I think in education, I think that's what it must surely be, is about sharing and talking about problems and critical problems and, and finding solutions and ways to celebrate and, and address them to a point that we have a sense of norm, norm, normalcy and really around some of the issues. But we, you know, engaging with as wide a demographic of people as possible is, is, is so, so important. And, I, you know, I hope I hope that the museum sectors really sort of follow suit really with, 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 with Body Beautiful, because I think it, it's such an empowering and positive message that needs to become, I think, the norm. Um, somewhere along the line, fashion stopped celebrating everybody and started mm -hmm. celebrating, you know, very, very narrow um, demographics of people and, and depictions of people as well. Um, Eunice, uh, the idea of education, that probably takes me on to discussing your book. And, and I thought that was quite a powerful, um, move for you you know and, uh, and in seeing the book it's sort of pitched really at sort of I would say young creatives thinking of entering um, the industry of, of fashion which is a sort of precarious challenging rich exciting scary wonderful crazy place um, full of very challenging people and wonderful loving people um, and I thought it was really interesting from the perspective of a sort of young reader how how if, if, if I'd read that when I was much younger, I might actually think, oh, OK, this is this is this is providing some context to that industry uh, and chart some ways to sort of get through. But um, it sounds maybe like an obvious question, but what led you into uh, writing the book and, and why did you want to address um, audiences in that way? I think for me personally, when I came into the industry, I really did not have a clue. I didn't really know much about it. And, you know, throughout my, I suppose, career, I had to negotiate a lot of really um, conflicting situations whereby I had to consider, I suppose, what I call in the book, core beliefs. Um, and, you know, through my experience, I just thought to myself, I couldn't understand why there was no book that existed that literally was almost like a how-to guide for the fashion industry because I really felt that that would actually prevent a lot of exploitation that can also occur um, because one thing that became really clear to me um, as I be began to grow in my career is I would meet a lot of young people who wanted to do different things, whether it was work as a creative or to be fashion models. And a number of people actually revealed to me that they had actually um, suffered exploitation. And that was, you know, of self, as well as in terms of monetarily, you know, there was various different things that can happen. For example, there was one young guy and he came to one of my DJ sets I was doing on Oxford Circus. 
And he told me he joined this model agency and he paid, I think, £2,000 to join. And as soon as he said that, I was like, wait, stop right there. Like, no professional fashion model agency is going to charge you money just to sign up. And it was something that was so obvious to me. But then, you know, as I began to research more into it, I began working with an amazing, incredible woman called Carolyn Franklin and really discovered the extent of the exploitation. So for me, all I really wanted to do was to write this book to give some you know, guidance and direction on the industry and also just to prepare people for some of the situations they might have to learn to negotiate and also to say to them that you don't have to um, throw away who you are or necessarily even change who you are. You just need to understand this is the industry you're working in. Therefore, if perhaps you have a different body shape, if perhaps you have a different look, you may or may not face more resistance. But ultimately, there's been so many incredible models who've come before me, who still exist now, who have paved the way and who have, you know, exploded ideas and stereotypes of what a model should be, what they can be. So for me, I really just wanted to create something that did that and supported people and also, you know, highlight areas such as diversity as well as dealing with rejection. Thank you. And I think that's really kind of pertinent, you know, based on the idea that I think the fashion industry is waking up to mental health um, really as well and, and waking up to the fact that it has a sort of role to to take in care and um, my my approach or my entering into the fashion industry was always you need to be tough you need to be tough but I know very few tough creatives I know a lot of very sensitive and caring and lovable and naive creatives <laughs> when you're young but I don't know that many tough creatives so I think being tough is sort of a message that I don't think helps the fashion industry um, moving forwards now I'm aware of time here. I think it would be really good to move on to some sort of Q and A's from from some of the audience. And there's something. So there's some there's some questions that have dropped into the into the chat there. So I'd I'd really probably I I could have gone on in many of these subjects, um, you know, in great depth. But it'd be great to ask a few questions if that's okay um, at the moment. So I'll just scan through some of these. So um, I've got one for Eunice. Um, so it says Eunice's book provides advice for those aspiring to, to work in the fashion industry. Ah, good question. Did you have a role model when you first started out yourself? Um, I think I'm going to be so cheesy and I'm not going to choose someone from fashion. I'm definitely going to have to say my mum because she's like my greatest supporter. And then after her, I would say I was really inspired by a variety of different people in completely different industries. Um, you know, it doesn't matter if it was someone like Maya Angelou or even someone like Lauren Hill. You know, I really I love looking at people's journey because I remember reading this quote when I was really young and it was by this guy called Marcus Garvey. And he said, a people without the knowledge of their past history and culture is like a tree without roots. And I was like thinking about it and thinking about it. And then I was like, wow, this is like really deep. So I think for me, I'm really into, you know, understanding the past and looking at the past mm -hmm. and using that to better inform myself, not focusing on it, but just using it to kind of understand what's going on right now. So, um, yeah. Great, thank you. And I think I think it's always good to have a have a role model, who, whoever that might be, sort of um, moving forwards. But thank you. And then I think the next another question is probably either to Georgina or to Eunice, which is thinking outside of art schools, museums, and high fashion. What have you seen within wider popular culture that has made you think that diversity in fashion has made it into the mainstream? Eunice, do you want to start? <laughs> no, I think you should start. Do you know? <laughs> I think the very fact that we talk about it now, actually, and I think the fact that it's 
every headline. It's whether you are a Guardian reader, the Observer, Grazia magazine, Teen Vogue. It you know it's it's in common parlance as we say. It's you know I think the people are talking about things like the theory of intersectionality and what that means, and we're having much more open conversations. And I think that's where it has it shows that it has also moved on from fashion. I mean, you, you can see the kind of um, what arose around Emmy nominations. I mean, Michaela Cole, let's, let's use her as a great example that she, um, I think one of them overlooked her for awards for that amazing series I made, Destroy You. And that was what she was wearing. The She won the award of the BAFTA where she was wearing the Maximilian dress and she subsequently, I think, won Emmys. Um, but, you know, so it's it's filtering into all these other areas of popular culture as, you know, this ongoing conversation and people are not letting it go. And I also think uh, social media as a platform is democratizing who can advocate for it. I did, it, actually, I was watching the Outsiders series that um, Eunice is in that's on YouTube. Um, and there's a very good point made within that, that um, while who can create content and who can have these conversations is now much more democratic, who controls them is still a very diff different conversation but there is a lot of content on social media these conversations are being held in other places um you know there's lots of people who are just body positivity advocates or you know advocating for social justice and I think it's just filtering into more organically I think into other areas of our lives great answer thank you <laughs> And I see just just to, we've we've got a question from um, Ethel um, in the in the I say the audience or Eth Ethel who's who's attending tonight. So it's um it's to Eunice, and the question is simply who is your favorite designer? Which is my favorite question. So um, who's your favorite designer? Oh, that's a really really hard question. <laughs> um. Um, I, uh, it's, it's really tricky guys, because you know already I'm really eclectic and I, I'm kind of like one of these people that I'm with clothing. I can be quite extreme. I'm either like super casual or very, I suppose, chic. Um, so I'll go for someone that's, I'll choose people that are very contemporary. So, um, Contemporary, modern, I would, I really like what Oliver Rice doing is doing right now. And obviously it's Jeremy Scott. Um, I think that it's just really exciting and colourful. Um, yeah, but I kind of feel like I have a different designers for like different moods that I, I might be in. So um, I, I like fun designers. I like people that really have fun with what they do. But then I also love designers who can mix, you know, emotion and real life with, you know, some of that really structured tailoring. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's the worst. I, I always find that from a fashion, a fashion perspective, a question I can never answer as well. It depends okay. on how, how good their collections were that season. And before we, before we sort of finish, I'm going to ask you each, um, the same question, and it's it's really straightforward and just requires a one word answer. But what does fashion in twenty twenty one mean to you? So that's to to both of you in 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 one word, if you could sum it up. I would say inimitable, which basically means it's like no other time that has existed. No, one. yeah. Thank you. And Georgina? I'd say emotional. So I think we've realised during the pandemic, as we've all lived in joggers and things, um, that clothing, what it means for us is it's much more to do about how we feel and how it makes us feel. Yeah, I, could, I couldn't agree more with uh, both of those um, answers as well. So that's that's a lovely way to, to sort of finish up. But I'd just like to say a, a massive thank you to, to both of you for engaging in that exciting conversation today and, and, and or, or tonight. And also, um, yeah, it, it, I think it, it, there's so much more that 
that, that is there for discussion. Um, but it, it really has sort of for anybody that you know, that really wants to check some of this out, check check out Eunice's work and also Georgina's amazing work with the Body Beautiful exhibition, which is um still still touring. And Georgina, it's got another two, three, three venues to go to, I think. Is that right? Three more venues, yeah. And you can also see um, Eunice's um, MBE and other objects in Scotland, a changing nation um, on level six of the National Museum of Scotland. Um, and we'll be in touch, um, the NMS will be in touch with a short survey to help uh, shape future online programming, um, including an opportunity to sign up for the museum newsletter as well. And you can't tell that I was reading that bit from a script there, could you? Um, but I'm just, just switching up to make sure that I, I, I ran out perfectly, but um, I just want to say a massive thank you to you and also to the audience that have joined us um, this evening on a Friday. Um, I don't know if ever, anybody that's not in Scotland at the moment will not know that we're in the middle of some sort of gale force storm outside. So I'm glad we've, we've got the, through this without a sort of, um, you know, un, unbroken internet really. So, um, but thank you so much. And um, yeah, really relish the conversation today. And I think it's, um, I'll go away this evening feeling really empowered and probably not able to sleep very well because I'm so excited by the potential of, of future stuff that's happening in fashion. So um, thanks to both of you and, and thanks everybody. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye.